Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me here. It's actually a pleasure to have the opportunity to share with you some uh, uh, lessons that uh, we learn uh, working on the Deadwood project. Um, it's actually an uh, interdisciplinary uh, um, collaborative uh, work done uh, between different agencies, different institutions, and also internationally. There were several PI that worked on this project. I am just one of them. And it was uh, made such that we can have uh, biologists, hydrologists, uh, geomorphologists, river morphology, limnologists, and civil engineers all work together in order to solve uh, a problems that we find there. So why the Deadwood? Deadwood is located in a central Idaho. Is in this location over here. Here is the Deadwood Reservoir. It's right in the middle of uh, the Deadwood Rivers. The upper part is still a natural system. So the lower part uh, is uh, regulated now from the dams. The reservoir has different uh, tributaries, and also we have different tributaries, major tributaries, actually, of the Deadwood River. Why we wanted to study these problems? Why we went, we went and we focalized on the Deadwood? Deadwood has the characteristics to be a simple reservoir. It has a, as a major uh, purpose to provide irrigation flows. However, it is a part of a several reservoir in a central Idaho that are managed together in order to provide electrical power, to provide the flood protections, irrigation flows, but also recreational sport, water sports. One of the major problems is that we have some biological opinion that needed to be answered. One of the concerns was uh, what is the habitat quality in the lower part of the Deadwood uh, River, which is affected by the reservoir, on a bull trout. Bull trout is a cold, fresh water fish. It requires a certain temperature and a certain habitat. The other characteristic of this uh, uh, fish, of this species, is that um, its behavior its behavior differently in different locations. So it's very site specific. We cannot take the preference curves or the habitat that we study in a certain watershed and then bring it back in this one in order to understand how that fish will uh, behave in uh, that uh, systems. The other characteristics is that it was a very challenging working in these systems because in the lower part here, this piece of bull trout was virtually extirpated, so we don't have that fish. The other vision that um, was very appealing in this project is that the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation has a, a very visionary leadership, and they wanted to engage several funding agencies in order to study this problem, not just in the lower part and answering what is happening there, but to look at the, all the watershed holistically. So see what's happening in the reservoir, see what's happening in the tributary of the reservoir, so upstreams, and also look at what's happening downstream, such that any type of uh, management that we do in the reservoir, how that will imp impact the, the entire watershed. Not only the stop there, but they wanted to consider what's happened in a system where we have uh, climate variability. What's happened if the system gets drier over the years? What's happened if we get more and more rainfall? What's happened if we have a more snowpack? How then we can change the management of the reservoir in order to account for all of these shifts in the environment. So and at the beginning, it seems that it's easy to work in the system. So we have just one purpose on this uh, uh, reservoir, which is uh, irrigation floor. We need to provide enough water for the agriculture. But it's a very remote location. It's very difficult to access uh, the systems. So the lower th uh, uh, part of the reservoir is almost 40 kilometers long. There are no roads to go through that, neither hiking trails. The only way that we can go there is just floating from the top from the reservoir down to the confluence with the Payette rivers. During the winter, the weather is so extreme that there is no possibility to access there rather than during very warm days and through helicopter flights. So we needed to have different tools in order to monitor the environment and to collect data. We just can't send the personnel over there. The other challenge is this one. We are living in a society where we depend on global position systems. We think that they work everywhere. However, within the canyons, there were no good connection, satellite connection either. We couldn't use uh, uh, survey techniques that were traditionally because we couldn't get 
uh, in the bottom of the canyon and be able to survey it with uh, GPS tools. The other way would have been to use uh, the classical uh, total station, make a measurement for 48 kilometers, and then uh, track everything back to a large degree the made with the GPS. But that is not the way that we decided to do. What we decided to do is to use a novel type of technology and using a cascade of models in order to answer first the biological opinions, to see if we can address those ones. But the other one that uh, they charge us also to find is to answer these two simple questions. One is, can we actually use a basin-wide processes to scale them down in order to characterize what a fish or a population is doing and a so insect? The insects are very important because those are the basic food for the trophic chain. The other one was what tools can we develop to facilitate a management decision at the, both the rich scale and the basin scale? So to do that one, we decided to use uh, um, heavy monitoring systems First, to be able to characterize the system, to define a conceptual model. Use then the survey uh, data in order to see if the conceptual model fits and responds exactly as we expect it. And then after that one, to adjust the numerical model. First of all, is measurement. Measurement is extremely important. Because it was so remote, in order to get information on how the reservoir worked, we used the lake diagnostic systems. This uh, system has the capacity to have a different sensor that uh, uh, monitor the water from the top down to the bottom. We can have uh, several information. So here in these graphs, we can see the depth is on the x-axis. Meanwhile, in the longitudinal axis over here, we have uh, the date. And here is the water surface elevation within the reservoir. The color schemes presented here, the temperature has changed in a particular location in the reservoir. So using the ELCOM model developed uh, by the um, Western Australia, University of Western Australia, we were able to monitor to have this information in any locations into the reservoir. In this case, it is near the outlet. And that is important for us because then we can feed that on a, to the downstream flow. Here we have temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen uh, at the saturation percent in milligram uh, per liter, and other important information like electrical conductivity and chlorophyll A. All these data were then streamed directly to the office of Joran Inberger in uh, his office in Perth, such that we could uh, in real time monitor what's happened. And then that information can be fed into his numerical model in order to predict what is going to happen. The other uh, tool that we used was uh, the Experimenta Airborne Research LiDAR, which was originally developed by NASA and now working with the US Geological Survey. It's a different type uh, of LiDAR. It doesn't use the near-infrared uh, systems, but it uses uh, the green uh, spectrum. The difference between the two is that, uh, meanwhile, uh, the red, the near-infrared, is uh, totally absorbed by the water in the first few centimeters. The capacity of the green is that uh, has a very low absorbance into the water, so that theoretically we can actually monitor the stream bed for a, a stream that is almost 40, kilo, uh, sorry, 40 meter deep. So this uh, tool uh, is uh, flies over the streams. It can uh, so send a full waveforms that is then recorded into the into the airplanes, and here is the. Uh, waveform that is uh, refracted. The first part over here is uh, the water surface elevations. Here we have uh, some scattering that usually is typically done uh, by sediment that are in a suspension. If it is a uh, nice and clear water, this one is a nice flat line. And then here we have another response, which is the actual bed of the, uh, of the streams. Uh, it's important to recognize that uh, there is a problem between the two when uh, the system is very shallow. We have the two waveforms that at that point are convoluted, and then we had to develop a new technique to convolve those ones. Usually for a nanosecond, uh, the light is moving 15 centimeters, and these problems, is the convolution is not important when we do have uh, depths that are more than a feet deep. So this tool is the one that we use in order to characterize the topography. That's what the green LiDAR provides us, is a continuous DM of the stream bed with a uh, resolution of one meter by one meter. Notice here this uh, particle over here that we noticed, are this large um, boulder here, some uh, logs over here. We validated this model, unfortunately, not directly in these systems because it was very difficult to get the accurate uh, um, survey, 
ground surveys, so we did it in a nearby streams, and we have a vertical uncertainty of the order of 13 centimeter and horizontal uncertainty on the order of uh, 50 centimeter, which is uh, usually typical of uh, the red LIDAR. So this type of uh, data were used now to feed the 1D and then the 2D hydrological modeling and the uh, 2D hyperic model. Then we did an extensive collection of data, both in uh, the winter, flying uh, there, and then uh, during the summer, all of uh, the major tributary where um, we have hydrological gauges in order to correlate uh, the stage with the discharge. We measure the velocity in order to validate the numerical model in the 2D and the 1D. And then we did all also telemetry. We trapped and tagged uh, a fish in order to know where they were at each moment of the day, what were they habit, where they were within the reservoir, where they were into the tributaries. That information then were fed into the numerical model, in the physical numerical model, in order to understand how they behaved. Here is uh, the linkage. Here we can uh, see where each dot is our fish on a particular date. This could be the water uh, temperature and dissolved oxygen in uh, the different spot in uh, to the rivers, and then that were fed, uh, that were actually identified using the uh, lake diagnostic tools. So now that I presented what we tried to do, I wanted to provide some uh, some interesting and uh, sometimes not so uh, expected result. Um, here is the diagram that we use, so reservoir data fed into ELCOM. This one was the reservoir, the 3D, then the information from the reservoir was fed into the river systems that were studied in 1D in order to get the discharge, the temperature, and water quality along uh, uh, the longitudinal directions, and then we use a 2D model in, a in order to calculate the local velocity and um, shear stresses that then we can uh, use for the biological uh, energetic model. One other piece that we did is not only looking at the surface, but also what's happening in the subsurface. So we also look at the hyperic, because the surface water also flows also into the interstices. Especially during the spawning season, it's important to know how much uh, water gets uh, into the stream bed and how much oxygen gets there and what is the temperature of that uh, water. So it is a picture of uh, uh, an aerial photographs of the reservoir. And uh, here is the topography. So we have accurate topography, both of the river and the reservoir. Here is an example of the type of result that we get. Here, very near uh, to is uh, the outlet of the reservoir. This one here is the temperature. The bullet trout, uh, we thought, and that's what the literature shows us, is that if we get the closer to 13, 14 degrees, they start uh, to be stressed by the temperature. If it gets uh, higher than 15 degrees, then uh, they will try to avoid uh, that uh, temperature niches. It means that uh, during uh, the September area here, between uh, the end of August and the beginning of September, we get uh, to temperatures that are definitely much higher than what uh, the fish would like. The other interesting part is that uh, the system's very close to the outlet of the reservoir, which is, it is the Deadwood is a bottom uh, outlet uh, type of dams, we get uh, concentration of dissolved oxygen, they start to be an oxid. That uh, has a lot of um, implication of what happened, not only in the reservoir, but also downstream. Because if the system is an oxid, there are a lot of metal that, that uh, become soluble, and then they move from the reservoir down to the streams, and they can, in fact, impact at that point that habitat. What was uh, very interesting to us is this one here. Here we have uh, the natural temperature, and here is the simulated that then we validated using uh, two different run down, uh, ramping down systems. Ramping down means that uh, we are at the, the irrigation flow and now we want to go down to the base flow uh, discharges. So if we are using a fast ramping down of three days or a slow ramping down with six days, notice it here the impact that we do have on the temperature. Just a small variation in the operation over here has a dramatic influence that is on the order of two degrees on what happened at downstreams. So that was something that was interesting for us, that in certain locations, timing of a certain operation has a, a key effect on the whole system itself, because that also impacts how long that the warm water and that the lack of oxygen also remain in the reservoir. The other interesting result was this one. We did a collection of microinvertebrates, which is uh, the food chain of uh, uh, 
higher um, aquatic species. Here in uh, the upper part, the natural part of the deadwood systems, within uh, the deadwood systems, so below the reservoir, then in nearby systems. All of them represented, based statistically, the same distributions. That means that the dam operations so far didn't have uh, that strong as impact as we were assuming. The other characteristics is this one. Here is uh, the longitudinal profile that we have uh, using the LIDAR for all, uh, um, this one is uh, following the Thalbeck. Here is, uh, we can uh, see a uh, zoom in how much variability we have uh, between uh, uh, the beginning of a, a, a big steep ramp here, some pools, and uh, some big boulder over there. If we use uh, this information to drive an accurate model, the other important interesting result that we got is this one here. Moving from uh, here is uh, near the reservoir down uh, to the confluence with the Payette, and for different discharges from uh, even a zero water coming out from the reservoir, we can see that the amount of uh, water exchange between the river and uh, the sediment remain almost the same. That was uh, something that uh, we were not uh, uh, expecting, actually. So we did some testing in a certain uh, some temperature logger at a different depth into the rivers and then let them run uh, during the year to see if uh, the predictions of the numerical model was actually matching. And what we found is that uh, the flux uh, through the stream bed was actually remaining constant through all the year. Another important characteristic that we use is the 2D model in order to see if there were barriers at different flows, if uh, there was a disconnection so between one pool to the other, even at the very low flows into the systems. And what we notice is that uh, even though it's very fragmented, there were always areas where the fish could actually move and migrate upstreams and downstreams. But one of the most interesting parts is this one here, is provided by these uh, graphs. Here is, are all our fish that we were uh, monitoring. Here is the temperature that the fish were experiences in all of this dot. What was remarkable for us is this one, that there were a lot of fish that were above the 12, 13, uh, centim uh, 15 uh, Celsius degrees, and a lot above the 15s, that actually were living very well in that area. So that's a stress, the importance that uh, each species may behave differently. It's important to, to monitor what's happening in a certain location and not just taking uh, some uh, um, wisdoms that come from another watershed and apply it in that watershed. It may not, just don't work because the species will behave differently. So what I would like to conclude is that uh, there is there is a lot of things happening around the reservoir, and we are going to depend more and more in storage, in water storage. But there is a, a lot of information that we can gather from this type of analysis. First of all is that we can actually develop the smart dams that can be retrofitted or built in such a way that we can manage that, not only to preserve the habitat as it is now, but can be actually used in order to offset some of the negative impact that climate change may have in a certain locations. Release of cold water pools from a reservoir in a certain uh, times of the year can actually be extremely beneficial, especially in the Pacific Northwest, when a salmonid runs the return may need that cold water in order for their metabolism to slow down and be able actually to reach their natal streams. Then the other part that uh, I would like to share with you is some lessons that we learned. And these ones are not so much technical, uh, but it's something that we found out that are essential to have a project, a project actually working out on ice. The first one is to have all the investigators, and I mean everybody, from the engineers down to, well, not down, but uh, through the biologists, to be familiar with the systems in order to understand and develop at that point a common vocabulary. That is uh, something that is interesting because we found out that it was easier for us actually to work with uh, colleagues that were in different continents. I am a civil engineer and I was very comfortable to talk with an hydraulics, uh, uh, Jorgen Berg, that was working on, uh, on the 3D of, uh, of the rivers, but I have difficulty in using the same terms uh, as a pool with a biologist. If you try to describe what is a pool or what is a reef falls, 
as a morphology or civil engineer is quite different, and you can realize it if I talk with a biologist. So it's very important to define those at the very beginning, because at the end, we have the two studies that thinks that they talk the same language, but they are not. Another important, so having the same, but the other important part is this one here, different scientific approaches for different disciplines. I have a certain approach, and a fish biologist or a microbiologist is a different one than mine. It needs, we need to understand why they are different and to find, as for the computer, for the different uh, um, software to be able to communicate the same, is the same between disciplines. We need to find that interface that the, can make us work together. And that is very important, it needs to be done at the very beginning when we meet to understand. And then develop conceptual model, take a measure of data, and even before starting the numerical model to validate the conceptual model. That's very important because it might happen that, that, that the conceptual model that we build may lead us uh, to a different answer or a different path that is not the correct one. The other one is to standardize the data collection, not only in the same uh, discipline, but among disciplines, such that if I talk about uh, gravel bed rivers, it's the same for me and the biologist. If I talk about the median grain size, we know how to collect and how we collect it. And to end, the, one of the most inter interesting part is actually to have a common repository or a web service where we can link all the different uh, repositories seamlessly such that the data are not uh, uh, lost and uh, it's important to have uh, very defined and good reported metadata to follow the data itself. I would like to end with this important part, to monitor the systems, especially after the project is done and uh, our prediction has been accepted and may be used for uh, the system management, it's important to monitor it. Right now, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation is actually doing that. And they are looking at what uh, happened in the last uh, two years and see how those two years correlate for our prediction that we made in order to make sure that uh, what we study is actually what is uh, really happening. And then uh, they can use what uh, we developed in order to make operational uh, decisions. Thanks. Thank you.